Check, 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 check. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, a couple quick things before we start. Um, we don't have uh, children's ministry except for child care for uh, zero to three years old downstairs. Um, so they can head down at this time. But for the summer, we're not doing um, um, older than that. So just so you guys know. If you're new with us, we have coffee in the lobby. And there's also bathrooms um, back that way to the right. Um, and you guys can head back there at any time to grab coffee or to use the restroom. So hey, welcome to worship this morning. Um, so good to be back after a week in Colorado, hanging out with some students. Um, I'm really excited to share some testimonies from that in the future. Um, but this morning, I just wanted to share real quick before we enter into worship together, um, just some things, I guess, on my heart as we um, just enter into a time of celebrating and remembering the Lord. Um, and actually just a cool moment this morning, just talking with, with Barry, actually, and a couple people, and just sharing memories of older songs and, and times in our lives where um, we really remember God moving through some of this older music. And for me, um, you know, the series Same God, as we look at like the faithfulness of God and how um, we can look back and know, it reminds me of that song, Do It Again, right? Um, I've seen you move and I believe you're gonna do it again. Um, I'm just, I'm this week singing some of these songs. It's like, it's taking me back to some of those moments that I remember so near and dear to my heart of God being so present and so near to me. Um, and it just reminds me of in the Old Testament, um, the Israelites building an altar to remember the Lord. Um, when, they, when there was a moment where they wanted to remember this time and remember this moment that God moved. Um, there's this really cool example of that in Joshua. As um, the first time the Israelites actually entered the promised land. Um, it's like this perfect example of God's faithfulness and his promises coming true after years and, of wandering and um, you know, generations of people. They finally enter into this place. Um, and in the book of Joshua, there's like 10 chapters of them dispersing the land. And it's, in a way, it's kind of boring to read it, but when you think about it, it's like this is the fulfillment of a promise that the Lord made to them. Um, and in, in, in light of that, they said in Joshua chapter 22, it says, let us get ready and build an altar, not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you and the generations that follow that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. And we said, if they ever say that to us or to our descendants, we will answer, look at the replica of the Lord's altar, which, which our generation built, not for burnt offerings and sacrifices, but as a witness between us and you. And so this morning, it's kind of nostalgic for me, especially. These are my childhood. It probably maybe not even seem that old to some of you in this room. But for me, this is, um, this is, um, this is really where I first met God. Um, and I think my, my encouragement and my prayer for us is as we worship, is it fun and is it nostalgic? Yes, but it's also a remembrance of God's faithfulness to us. Um, and so I encourage you, maybe this is, a, this is a morning just to go back to that altar um, and to go back to remember the Lord's movement um, because we need him now the same way that we did back then. And he is the same God today. Um, so if you're able, let's stand together. Um, I'm just going to pray for us, and then we're going to have some fun. We're going to worship, right? So, Lord, um, we just come before you this morning. We thank you um, for who you are. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, that you're not a God that forsakes or abandons or leaves us, but you are a God who is faithful and is constant um, and is the same um, as you were um, in the 90s, as you were in the 80s, and as you were back in the Israelites um, in the Old Testament, Lord, you are constant. And so we worship you this morning, and we ask, God, would you speak truth into our hearts where it's needed? God, would you encourage our spirits, and would you lift us up? And may you just bring, maybe for some of us, a remembrance and a reminder of who you are as we worship you, Lord. And so we give you glory this morning, we give you honor, and we give you our praise. May your, may this praise, may you, we ask that you would inhabit this place. May your presence fill this room and fill this place. So we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. All right.
Jesus, we make that our prayer and our declaration this morning. We say there's nothing on earth, there is nothing in this life that compares to you, Lord. We ask, God, would you just continue to speak to our hearts? May you just rekindle that fire, Lord. Maybe for some of us, it feels like it's, it's been let out, maybe. And God, we, we, we thank you that you have never left. It says in your word that you stand at the door of our hearts and you knock. And I pray, Lord, for those of us that have never let you in, and for those in this community, God, that have never let you in, may you just rekindle the spark in us to go forth to be your kingdom, to be your children, to love you, and to be loved by you, God, that you may use us for a mighty and powerful work in this place, Lord. We say that you are worthy and you are powerful. All the glory and the honor goes to you, Lord. You are worthy of our praise. We thank you for this time, Lord. We pray that you would just be continued to move in our hearts, God, um, as we hear from your word, um, as we pray, as we come to you with our, our prayers, Lord. Um, we thank you that you are present, that you are near, that you, are, you care. You care for us and you hear us, Lord. I pray that you just continue to move and speak this morning, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can have a seat. Good morning. So happy to have you at Restoration Church. My name is Cece Roberts. And they, uh, it says in the Bible that the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective, right? And uh, it was the righteous prayers of my mom and dad that got me through the 90s. <laughs> I, uh, I graduated in 1993 from high school, from 1997 uh, in college, and I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you the rest of the story as we actually take our offering. Two ways to give to Restoration Church, either through our website, restorationchurch.church, or you can put something in the buckets that we will pass now. Um, so I graduated from high school in 93. I went to college um, in Ohio in 94. And my life really just started to take kind of a left turn. My parents could sense it. They got on their knees. They started praying for me. I uh, was a camp counselor at Spring Hill Camp the summer before my sophomore year, and I ended up falling in love with this boy who I followed to Hope College, and uh, the boy didn't love me back, <laughs> praise God, <laughs> uh, hardly got out of bed my junior year, and so when I, like, sing these songs from the 90s, and I'd be going to church, I'd be so depressed, so sad, why is my life not turning out the way I want it to? God knew he had a better plan like a way better plan. That guy is a child of God, but he's a loser too. So I just praise God that uh, he worked that out, and I was able to meet Dave just after I graduated from college. So it's fun. It's fun throwing back to some times in our life, you know. I don't know where you were at in the 90s, but, you know, to connect with what God was doing, it's, it's really fun. At restorationchurch.church, you can get information on what's happening within our community this summer. Next week, Austin and Dave Bonema are speaking. We support them. They're missionaries in Africa. And uh, Tate wrote most of the message. Isn't that what she said when we were talking to them this week? And uh, she just has incredible passion for Jesus. And I'm so excited to hear her and Austin talk about um, we were collecting money for the pastors to get the bikes. And so they'll have a report on that. Is it my microphone? Put it up closer to me. Oh. A little weird. Um, so that's next week. Grace um, Adventure is happening Tuesdays in July. It starts a week from this Tuesday. And we would love for you to take one Tuesday to volunteer to come out and help. So pick one Tuesday for the rest of July and you come hang out with kids. You just support what's happening. And this is an event for kids in our community. Um, we got, let's see, let me bring it up. We live downtown Zealand, and we got one of these um, brochures in our mailbox this week. So pretty cool outreach happening. And this isn't just for community kids, but it's for our kiddos as well. So Zane, Tuesdays in July. We're going to be heading out there. It's going to be great. Again, information on signing up to help is at restorationchurch.church. July 24th, we're going to have our worship service at Happy Hands Farm um, at the Pier Bolts, and it's going to be worship and baptism. So if anybody would like to be baptized, uh, connect with Dave. His email is on our 
homepage. And make sure you do read Dave's emails, <laughs> right? I know I don't. But you give me all the information I need to know. Just to remember, she's the one who doesn't uh, read any of her emails and has like a thousand unread messages, which would drive me nuts. Like, uh, and I know I've shared that uh, before, so I don't need to go into that. Um, well, we love to be a community that uh, prays together and uh, actually believes in the power of prayer because we believe in the one who is able and willing and desires to answer prayer, and that's God Almighty. And so we want to just take this time to uh, share any requests, anything that is on our hearts uh, that we want to pray for. Uh, we would love to open up the microphone. Why don't you grab it? Yeah, you're good. Um, and if, just raise your hand, and I'd love to share the microphone with you, and you can share with our community, and uh, we'll uh, pray all together in just a little bit. So I'm going to the back, so don't waste my journey back here. If you have a prayer request in this area, you know, hit me up first. All right, Jason, two minutes, bud. Okay. I'm going to have the same rule for, you, for Barry that I have for you. Here, let me, see, let me turn it on. It's not. I just want to see if it's on. There you go. I'm Congressman Peter Meyer. This community inspired me to serve in the Army, instilling the values that...
Father, I, I honestly just confess um, that I just don't know how you do it. I just, I hear the, the sweet sound of, of all these people praying and pouring out their hearts before you. And Father, you as a good Father, you hear everyone. You see everyone. You know everyone. And Father, I just, I'm amazed. I'm amazed by, by how good you are this morning. I'm amazed by how faithful you are this morning, by how loving you are, by how you pursue us over and over again. God, I thank you that you see us, that you know us, that your heart beats for us. You want us to have life and have it abundantly, so much so that you sent your son Jesus for us. And we give you thanks. Jesus, we just declare this morning that it's, it's all about you. It's all about your love. It's all about your grace. It's all about, about you and what you have done. I thank you that while we are still sinners, you died on the cross for us. I thank you that there's nothing that can separate us from your great love. I thank you for your pursuit over us. I thank you for the amazing gift that you've given us in, in sending the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. Thank you that we do not have to go through this life alone. Thank you that, that your very presence is in us. And I ask, Jesus, that more and more of your presence would be poured out here this morning. Lord, that we would surrender to you more today. That we would be in love with you more today. That our eyes would be open to seeing the ways that your kingdom is advancing all around this world, all around the community. And Lord, give us a greater hunger to be active members in your kingdom seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that you'll take care of everything because you have in the past and you will in the future. And so we are planting our feet firmly on the rock of your son, Jesus. And thank you for the hope that comes from that. Thank you for the hope that comes from knowing Jesus. Thank you for the peace that comes. And now, Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you continue to move in this place. We declare that you're welcome here, and you're more than welcome here, you're needed. We need you desperately to move and guide and shape our hearts. We need you to reveal Jesus. Give us an encounter with Jesus that will transform us this morning. We pray in his name, the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, it's been an interesting week and just some conversations. So if you didn't know, Maddie Karsten, uh, she takes care of putting together little graphics and throwing them out on um, Instagram and, and Facebook. And I said, hey, can you put something out there for the 90s? And she was like, well, what's the fashion from the 90s? What were the colors of the 90s? And I'm like, oh, it was so diverse. You had, you had like uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and the bright colors. And some of you are like, who's that? Like Will Smith before he whatever, went crazy um, at the Oscars. So that was Fresh Prince, like all the bright colors. And then you had like the, the punk rock thing of the, the 90s. And anybody here like wear those clothes from the 90s? Like the you know, punk rock, anyway. Uh, you had that. And then you had like something that, that was near and dear to my heart, which was like the flannels and the grunge of the 90s. And uh, that, for me, that was it. Like the 90s were just an interesting time, this diverse time. But it was also a time that, and more importantly, a time that I really encountered Jesus for myself. Um, just really, really encountered his love. And, and Tyler was sharing like, okay, these are the songs that we're going to do. And I'm like, great. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but up here I was having a moment. And I was shocked. It was like, shout to the Lord. And Darlene Check or like, you know, uh, Ali Bosma just, you know, singing that this morning. I'm like, oh my goodness. It just, it got me, it brought me back. And a tear, a little tear coming, coming down my eyes. I'm like, oh my goodness. But that was a moment, like that was the decade when frankly, Jesus became real. When it went from like the faith of my parents and, and my parents brought us to church at a, at a later time in, in my life. And uh, it went from moving from the, the faith of my parents to me and realizing Jesus loves me. Jesus saved me. Jesus died for me. And this morning, I just was hit again with like, that's where it needs to start. That's where it needs to end is it's all about Jesus. And I, I think about the prayers that I've prayed for people, the prayers that I pray constantly for my kids, the prayers that I pray for all of us in this room. And, and my prayer for today is that we would have an encounter with Jesus, that we would love Jesus with all that we are, that we would live wholeheartedly for Jesus, that nothing else would matter, that we would seek first Jesus and his kingdom and his righteousness, that it would all be about Jesus. 
and this deep love for him. A couple weeks ago, I was reading in this magazine, and I came across this story of a man by the name of John Chow. And I'm going to show a video in just a little bit, and you'll remember him. But this was a young man who gave his life for Jesus and lost his life as he went on to a, uh, an island where people other than the tribal people had never gone before. And just recently, I, was, um, I read about the motivation that he had and the reason he did that. And at that time, a lot of people were questioning why he was doing what he was doing, but it was motivated by a deep love for Jesus. And that's the thing I want us to walk away from this morning, is just where are you at with Jesus? Where is your love for Jesus at today on this July 3rd, 2022? So here's a story of John Chow, and then I'll share a little bit more. God, I don't want to die. Who will take my place if I do? Jesus told his followers to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, to every nation, to the ends of the earth. John Chow was a teenager when he took his first missions trip and when he felt called to invest his life to reach the people of North Sentinel Island, who had violently rejected all previous contact with outsiders. John answered that call. Here am I, send me. For the next nine years, every decision John made was with an eye toward going ashore on North Sentinel Island. He served in multiple countries to gain missions and ministry experience. He trained in linguistics to help learn their language. He was certified as an EMT in the hope of serving the tribesmen medically. Once I said yes to Jesus, I was committed. I was all in. I believe that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience. I want my life to reflect obedience to Christ and to live in obedience to him. I think that Jesus is worth it. He's worth everything. In 2018, with the backing of his missions agency, John went to North Sentinel Island. He knew the risks, but his passion for the North Sentinel leaves and his desire to be obedient to Christ drove him forward. Sitting in the boat, getting ready to go ashore, John penned a final note and a challenge to his family. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshiping in their own language as Revelation 7, 9 to 10 states. I pray none of you love anything in this world more than Jesus Christ. Within hours of writing those words, John Chow was killed by the Islanders. John believed that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience, and he would be obedient to God's call, no matter the cost. Who will pay the price to go to every tribe? hearing about him and people questioning his, his motivation and why did he go and was he prepared. And I love in a video and in the article that I read, it, his journey began at 17 when he heard those words out of Isaiah, who will go for me? And Isaiah says, like John, here I am, send me. 
And for the next nine years, every decision that he made was in preparation to go. The missions agency that he worked with said that he was one of the most prepared missionaries that they had ever met. Knowing he would not have hot water on the island, he would regularly, actually every day, take cold showers to get his body to adapt. He learned how to survive in the wilderness. Actually, being a wilderness guide out on the West Coast was uh, bitten by a rattlesnake, survived that. He took language courses in order to help him understand the language of the Sentinelese people. He undertook medical training so that he could provide health care for them. He got vaccinated against a bunch of diseases so he wouldn't bring Western diseases onto the island. He hung a huge map of the island in his dorm room and prayed for them every single day. But he didn't wait till he went over there to share the gospel. He got involved in a local ministry playing soccer and using his love of soccer to share the gospel with kids that he came in contact with. Everything that he did was to prepare him for the mission that he believed God had called him to, to share the gospel with the people on that island. Why? Because he believed in Revelation 7, 9, seeing the people from every tribe, every nation around the throne. And the only way that that would happen is if they heard and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know this was on the video, but I think this quote, two quotes, is worth repeating. He said this, I believe that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience. I want my life to reflect obedience to Christ and to live in obedience to him. I think that Jesus is worth it. He is worth everything. I mean, let those words sink in. He is worth everything. Is he worth everything to you? Is he worth your whole life giving up everything for him because he left heaven behind to come to earth to die on the cross for you? He gave up everything for us. Is he worth everything to us? But then this one. In his letters, he would often write to his friends and he would wrap it up this way. And he said, I pray that you will never love anything in this world more than you love Christ. I pray that you will never love anything in this world more than you love Christ. Like I said, there were so many different reactions within the community, Christian community, even without, without, with, outside the Christian community to his passing. Thought he was just looking at adventure, that he wasn't prepared. But here was a man who believed in the gospel. And the only way for people to be saved was for them to hear the gospel and to put their faith in Jesus. And currently there are one billion people on this, on this planet 13% of the world population who, like the Sentinelese people, are living without a knowledge of the gospel, have never heard of the gospel. And John was willing to give his life for that. And what was his motivation? I believe it was this absolute love, deep love for Jesus. See, I, I look at John's life and I think of lives of, of people in scripture. And Paul says in Acts 20, he says, I don't consider my life of any value. My life has no value except that I finish the work that Jesus has called me to do, and that's preaching the gospel to people. It reminds me of those in Revelation 12, uh, verse 11. It says, they didn't consider their life of any value except to pour it out for the sake of the gospel. Because of their love for Jesus, they didn't consider their life of any value except to proclaim Christ. And that's what Jesus invites us to. He wants complete devotion in our lives, complete and total devotion to him and to him alone. And so this morning, I want us to really like wrestle with this question up on the screen. And it's going to stay there for a while. Is there anything in this world that you love more than Jesus? Is there anything in this world that you love more than Jesus? Now, you can quickly be like, Oh, yeah, no, no, no. There's nothing in this world that I, I love more than Jesus. But like Piper says a lot, actually? She goes, actually? When you ask her a question, actually? No, is there anything in this world that you love more than Jesus? It's really a question of, of worship. Like a, a question of, of worship. In worship, I've heard this definition before. Worship is our response to what we value most. And we were wired to worship. We were wired to give our hearts away. We were wired to, be, to, 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 to give our love to something or someone else. We were wired to worship. And there are so many ways that you see worship uh, distorted all throughout our culture. 
I mean, you go to a concert and you see people raising their hands and wearing T-shirts that represent the band up on stage, and sometimes they're crying and they're weeping because they're so in love with the people up on stage. I mean, think back to those pictures of the Beatles or people back in the, in, in the past. That is a picture of worship. That is a picture of wh who we were created to be. We were created to worship, but so often our worship is misplaced. Our worship gets thrown off, and, and the older I get the more I realize this happens from generation to generation to generation. People, as much as we think we have progressed, people are the same because the heart is the same. Our hearts are prone to wander. Our hearts are, are prone to like, oh yeah, we love Jesus, but oh, we're gonna give our lives to other things. I was thinking this week of Exodus 20, 32. And Exodus 32 is actually a, a pretty sad story in scripture. The Israelite people have been rescued out of, of Egypt. They've been brought out of slavery, and they're wandering in the desert. They're being, they're, God is sending them into the promised land, leading them into the promised land. They've seen his miracles. They've seen his mighty hand at work. They've seen him part the Red Sea. And Moses is up on a hill, receiving the Ten Commandments in the presence of the Lord, and this is what we read. It says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountains. The people gathered themselves to, together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, the people said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. How quickly their hearts had moved away. Their hearts, they had seen the power of God at work. They had, had encountered the presence of God in powerful ways. They had seen him with a, a cloud by day and a fire by night. They had known his presence. They had known his deliverance. And because Moses went up in the mountain, they didn't know what was go going on to him. They said, Aaron, make us a God because we want to see this God that we want to worship. And, and then they said, like, here is the golden calf, and this is the God that brought us up out of Egypt. And I think of their hearts so distracted so diverted away from this one true love of the God who rescued them out of Egypt. And from generation to generation, you see it in the, the lives of the Israelites. You see all of a sudden King David rise up to power and he's a man after God's own heart and worships him and, and the Psalms are written by him. And then he has a son Solomon who encounters his presence, who, who is given this beautiful gift of wisdom. And then all of a sudden you see later in life, Solomon is wandering after other gods. And then from one king after the next, they bow down their knee to these false gods, to these idols that are in their lives. And I believe it kind of culminates in this picture that we see in 1 Kings 18. If you want to turn to 1 Kings 18, it's a story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And here, the nation of Israel is so captivated by these idols so Elijah, the prophet, uh, comes to them and asks a question that I think we need to wrestle with today. 1 Kings 18, it says, So Ahab, who was a wicked king, sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And Elijah sets up this challenge. He says, let's get two bulls. Let's put them on an altar. You cry out to your God, and I'll cry out to my God. And whichever God lights the altar on fire, lights the animal on fire, and consumes it, then that is the God we're going to worship. And so the people of Israel start cutting themselves and, and crying out to Baal and saying, light this fire, light this fire, and nothing happens. Elijah starts to taunt them and says, well, hey, maybe your God is on a vacation. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's sleeping. Cry a little bit louder. And he says this in verse, um, 20, uh, verse 20, actually, sorry, 28. It says, they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their, cus after their customs with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Imagine that, like that's what the crowd is doing. 
They so want the attention of this false god, they are cutting themselves and using so much energy. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the obligation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. It was silent. Why? Because idols are lifeless. They have eyes but don't see, ears but don't hear. And those who worship them become lifeless. And here were the people of God crying out, using up so much energy, trying to get the attention of this idol. And we look at that and we say, that's not us. That happened a long time ago. We don't live in a a third world country where they have little figurines and and idols all over the place. That's, That's not us. We're better than that. I think how often do we give our lives to lifeless things? See, idols are horrible gods because they don't deliver on their promises. They're lifeless. But how often do we give our lives to things that are lifeless, trying to find meaning, value, and purpose in things other than Jesus? Only Jesus will satisfy. Only Jesus will fill that deepest longing in our soul. Only Jesus gave up everything for us. Are we giving up everything for him? And I go back to the question of John Chow, where is our love for Jesus? Do we love anything in this world more than we love Jesus? Tim Keller wrote a book called Counterfeit Gods. And in that book, he talks about idols a lot. And he gives this definition. He says, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. The key to idols in our life, it's all about distorted love. Misordered or misplaced love. Love gets out of whack. There are things that are in our, comes, come into our lives, things that are, are good, that all of a sudden become to us more like a God. They become to us like God. See, it's not bad to love your family. You should love your family. It's not bad to love a career. Um, it's good to, to, hey, love a career, love what you do. But the problem comes, and I've seen it numerous times, when career overtakes the love of family. That is misplaced or disordered love. And so often things in our lives, hobbies, which aren't bad, it's good to love a hobby, it's good to have things that you enjoy doing, but as soon as that becomes a God to us, takes the place of God, that is when it becomes an idol. And so is there anything in your life that you love more than Jesus? You might be thinking, I don't know, I think I'm good. I think my life is pretty ordered. Well, Tim Keller goes on to say, An idol is anything so central and essential to your life, should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. An idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, your emotional and financial resources on it without a second thought. An idol is anything that you are looking to for meaning, value, significance, and security. And so I think this morning we need to search our hearts. Is there anything that we love more than Jesus? Over the years, there's been a bunch of questions that I would ask myself and time to use to search my heart to see if there is anything that has taken the place of Jesus. And these are the questions up uh, on the screen. And I want you just to think through these. Is there anything so central or essential in your life that if you lose it, you feel like life isn't worth living? If so, then there's an idol in your life. What is the one thing you can't live without? Frankly, if, you, if somebody takes it away, you flop on the floor like a two-year-old in a, a temper tantrum. Like, what is the thing, like, you just can't live without? I heard about it, and I'm going to use this just as an example. I heard about it as the kids were going out to Colorado, and they heard that their phones were going to be taken away. They started freaking out. They're like, ah, I can't go without my phone. And actually, they did take uh, their phones away, and they had a great week. And they're like, oh, yeah, that was actually a great experience. But there was a little bit of a, 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 t- a detox period. But actually, in talking to some adults, quickly I heard this. Oh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't have my phone taken away from me. Oh, well, then maybe it's an idol in our lives. 
What consumes most of your thoughts and feelings? What motivates the things that you do? Next slide. What brings the highest amount of frustration and anger in your life? What can set you off if all of a sudden something doesn't go as planned and it brings about anger and frustration? Maybe that has a hold of your heart too great. Maybe you've put that above your love for Jesus. What is the one thing that can change your mood in a second? What would your friends say is your favorite topic of conversation? It might be an idol. What gives you comfort? Is there a substance that gives you comfort? Is there something that you turn to for comfort more than Jesus? And this is an interesting thing. What is the one thing that you wish God would do for you? God, I want you to do this. I think about what Cece shared. And I remember praying in high school, God, let me date this one girl. Consumed my mind, consumed my heart. That was an idol. She was an idol in my life. And then I go to the, the, the great theologian Garth Brooks, thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> but that in a season in my life was an idol. As, as I get consumed, oh God, would you just do this or that in my life? It becomes an idol. And this morning I again ask, is there anything in our life that we love more than Jesus? The problem with idols is they are good things turned into God things. And we worship created things instead of the creator. And there are idols all around our lives. I think Colossians 3, Paul says, get rid of sexual morality, impurity, and greed, which is idolatry. I think that's a big one in our lives that leads to so much else. Greed is idolatry. Greed is is this love of money that 1 Timothy uh, talks about. Money is not the problem. Money, the love of money is. The love of money is the root of all evil and leads to so much other false worship. And there's so many different things that are idols in our lives. So many things that we're looking to for identity other than Jesus. And so what's the solution? What do we do? We have to properly order our lives. In this series called Same God, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it says in the Ten Commandments that God is a jealous God. God wants your whole heart. And so what we have to do is destroy the idols in our lives. I love this picture. And this is the thing that really hit me this week as I was reading in 2 Chronicles 14. This is the thing that kind of inspired this question in my life this week. And it's up on the screen, and it's a, a king who's actually a good king, one of the very few good kings. And this is, his name was Asa, and this is what he did. Abijah slept with his fathers, so that was that he, he died. And they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days, the land had rest for 10 years. And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the ashram and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and the commandment. Really, the picture there is he did more than just break down the pillars and cut down the ashram. He smashed them, it says, completely destroyed them. That's, that's how violent, if I can say that, that we have to be with our idols, Smash them, eliminate them from our lives. It says flee the love of idols in 1 Corinthians 10. That's what we need to do in our lives. And so this morning, I ask you, is there anything in your life that you love more than Jesus? You might be thinking, well, Dave, John Chow died. He lost his life in 2018. And even before that, he was all focused on on going to the island and probably didn't enjoy life all that much. And I would say to that, the opposite is true. He lived life to the fullest. And when those people on the the island took his life, John Chow became more alive in that moment because he was face to face with Jesus and heard the words, well done, good and faithful service. He lived his whole life for Jesus out of a deep love for Jesus. You want to find life You want to find it abundantly? Jesus is very clear. Lose your life. Give it all up to him, and there you will find life. And so the worship team is going to come up, and we're going to sing one more oldie but goodie. But I want that 
quote to stay up there on the screen. Because I really think, no, I really believe that we need to wrestle with this today. Is there anything in your heart that you love more than Jesus? And if so, the answer is simple and beautiful. You turn from that and turn towards Jesus. It's called repentance. And so it's simply saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for loving this thing in my life more than I love you. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Re restore unto me this, this heart for worship, putting you solely in first place in my life. And so as they sing, I'd really want you to think and reflect, is there anything in your life that you love more than Jesus?
all about you. It's all about you. Lord, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. all about life and and life is all about Jesus and the way that you're going to find life is to find life in Jesus and I think like so many people go through this world like with uh, in life through weighed down weighed down by sin by their own sin weighed down by the the sin of others and and the brokenness that they've experienced or the brokenness they've caused and the only way to have that brokenness the only way to have that sin taken off of our shoulders just by putting our faith in Jesus. And so maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus and I would tell you and encourage you the only way to have life is by putting your faith in Jesus, that Jesus came into this world to take that sin off of our shoulders by going all the way to the cross and dying the death that we deserved. And the Bible says if we put our faith in Jesus, if we believe in our heart, confess that he's Lord in our mouth, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and the Bible is so clear that we will be saved, we will be rescued, the old will be gone and the new will come, that we will be a new creation. And so may today be the day of salvation, may you cry out for Jesus, and the only way that you're going to have life and experience life to the fullest is by having that shame and sin lifted from your shoulders by putting your faith in Jesus. And so today, may you put your faith in him. Reach out to him. Cry out to him. Have conversations with people who are here about him. And Jesus, we want to be people who live wholeheartedly for you. So thank you for the ways that you have lovingly showed us the idols in our lives. And may we be bold in turning from them. May we live completely for you. Jesus, we pray for this world. We pray for those one billion people, the 13% of our our population that have not heard the gospel. God, would you you send us? Would you empower us to be bold proclaimers of the gospel? We pray for their hearts to be transformed. We pray for them to have visions and dreams where they reach out and cry out for you, Jesus. Jesus. And God, I do pray for the the, the people of the Sentinel Island. God, that you continue to raise up people, that their hearts would be softened, and that they would hear and respond to your gospel, Jesus. As we go from here, empower us by your spirit to proclaim your words with great boldness. And we ask for signs and wonders to be poured out all for the glory of Jesus so people will know him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. If you would like to receive prayer, I'm up here to pray with uh, people. Um, Others are available to pray. Um, God bless and have a great Sunday.